Well, good evening and welcome to uh, our first lecture of 2014. Hope everybody had a wonderful holiday season and I'm sure that our students have returned ready to refocus their attention on their rigorous studies. Tonight we are uh, very honored to have uh, Dr. Kennedy with us and before we get into some other introductions I want to point out uh, that uh, both the uh, grandsons of Chester Nimitz, uh, Chet uh, Lay Nimitz and Richard, uh, he goes by Dick uh, Lay Nimitz, are both here with us tonight. And I bring that up because not only are we honored to have them here in the audience, but on February 24th of this year, our next evening lecture series will be the rollout of uh, the Nimitz Gray Book. Now the Nimitz Gray Book is uh, Fleet Admiral Nimitz's notes to include some documents that were classified uh, dating back to 1972 and that have not been seen by the general public in large form ever. And we're gonna be rolling them out so that they're digitally available to the American public and all of our students. And we're going to have a rollout at a special ceremony that night. So we're very honored to have the, uh, the Nimitz grandsons uh, with us here tonight. Now, our lecture tonight is presented in memory of uh, Admiral Raymond Spruance, a great naval hero of the Second World War and a past president of the Naval War College. It's sponsored by the Naval War College Foundation through the generosity of Mr. and Mrs. Harold Finn. We are indeed lucky to have one of the world's foremost historians with us tonight, Professor Paul M. Kennedy, the J. Richardson Dilworth Professor of History at Yale University. Dr. Kennedy was born in Northern England and educated at Newcastle University and earned his doctorate at the University of Oxford. He's the author or editor of 19 books, including his best known work, The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers, which has been translated into over 20 languages. He's currently working on a revised version of this seminal work. As an aside, after his speech, Dr. Kennedy has graciously offered to sign copies of his books for those in the audience who have brought them. He's received numerous honorary degrees and was made a commander of the Order of the British Empire. CBE in 2000 was elected a fellow of the British Academy in 2003. Now tonight, I'm very pleased to announce that Dr. Kennedy's list of honors are going to grow a little bit by announcing that he has been selected to re receive the very prestigious Hattendorf Prize for Distinguished Original Research in Maritime History. The prize will be presented in a formal, formal ceremony later this year on Pearl Harbor Day. So I want to say tonight in front of this wonderful audience, congratulations to Dr. Kennedy. The Hattendorf Prize was established in 2011 to recognize the accomplishments of our very own Professor John Hattendorf, who is here with us tonight, who is himself a world-renowned historian and author. Thank you, John, for all you have done for the college for nearly three decades. So tonight, without further ado, we'll turn the stage over to Dr. Kenny for his presentation entitled, The Three Great Naval Wars of Recent History and Their Implications for American Sea Power Today. Dr. Kennedy, the floor is yours, sir. Admiral Carter, sir, uh, dear members of the Naval War College Foundation, uh, Professor Maurer, members of the faculty, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a, a great honor for me to be here, uh, back here with you tonight, and a particular honor, to, of course, for me to give the second Professor John Hattendorf annual lecture at the Naval War College. What a great idea to, uh, to do so. A combination of this college, the study of naval history and strategy, and a way of paying tribute to that remarkable student of American and international maritime history, John Hattendorf, who is uh, here in the uh, audience tonight. I see him down there. He's scrutinizing me with that uh, slight uh, mischievous look which he's uh, scrutinized at me since many, many years ago. Uh, I'm a bit uh, disabled, as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, by managing to fall downstairs on leave in Cambridge, England uh, last, last April, uh, but just last 
November, Professor Nat Handorf came over to address my new uh, Navy ROTC big lecture class at Yale, and uh, he stood there for an hour without any notes whatsoever to talk about uh, sea power in the modern world and sea power since 1945, and I thought, wow, how am I going to keep this guy down in the farm? I mean, why doesn't he have the wheelchair, if you don't mind my saying so? Uh, and then I would, I would be so, you know, alert and humane and polished, but I, I can't keep up with him. Um, I won't go into every uh, aspect, not at all, of Professor Hattendorf's long career as your Ernest J. King professor here uh, at Newport and, he, and the various ways in which he has encouraged as well as written and, and taught naval and maritime history over the, over the years. And uh, I'm, to repeat, I'm so honored to be able to give this second John Hattendorf lecture uh, tonight. I, I, I was going to say I will forbear to mention, but of course I'm going to mention that he and I both earned a DPhil at Oxford University uh, about a thousand years ago or something like that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, in, the, in this lecture tonight I perform as a naval historian, uh, but I also wish to offer brief reflections on the role of sea power in today's world and into the future. I, I venture to be so bold. This, after all, is the function of your renowned strategy and politics department here at the Naval War College. It's not a, simply a history department, not simply a politics department, uh, far from it. Though it has many distinguished political scientists and historians teaching and mentoring within it. It also has to act as the United States Navy's College for Teaching the Future Naval Leadership of the country and to assist the U.S. Navy itself in the consideration of contemporary and future maritime strategy based upon a serious reflection of the past. So I um, also wish to pay tribute to Professor John Maurer and all his colleagues at the uh, Strategy and Politics Department here at, at Newport. It has been a a beacon to many of us in, in the academy. Uh, its, fa its famous course is the course which we took over, we stole the, the clothes of, and turned into the, uh, the, the year-long grand strategy uh, course at, at Yale University. And uh, large numbers of distinguished people, distinguished politicians and others come to attend our, our grand strategy course at Yale and they say, wow, this is brilliant, this is just what we need. What, where did you guys get this Yale Grand Strategy course from? And I say, well, um, if you give my colleagues another drink, I will tell you that we took it from the Naval War College about 35 years ago. So home to home. Um, the three great naval wars of modern time we recollect as being that uh, long war between 1793 uh, and 1815, which we know of by reference as the French Revolutionary War with a brief, brief break and then the Napoleonic War. It may seem very distant from us now, especially as the fledging uh, US Navy really played no role in the major events there, the entry and exit in 1812 to 1814 being a, a brief exception. But there are nonetheless most interesting points to be made about and to consider on in that larger struggle for hegemony in Europe and beyond the world by Napoleon and his coalition and the opposite coalition, which remember was not just that led by Great Britain as a naval leader, but the coalition of the other powers of Europe. Uh, the Habsburg Empire of Austria, uh, Prussia, the German states, uh, Spain and its revolution, and also uh, Imperial Russia. Uh, a massive epic contest going over 20 odd years and something which therefore should bring things out of it which we could ponder on today. Large things of the past remain in the past. Many other things are to be picked upon and considered upon. So let me consider 
in each of the great world wars of the modern time, some things which I at least think are worth uh, bringing to your attention tonight, if I may. This war of 1793 to 1815 had a global range. Its sea power was projected nearby in the North Sea and into the Baltic, but also far afield around Africa and to the east. It had to be fought and won, of course, in the English Channel to prevent the armies of Napoleon from crossing into southern England. It had to be fought throughout in the Baltic to ensure the supply of naval stores from that sea to Britain and the Allies. It had to be fought and projected into the Mediterranean. Once the British had projected themselves into the Mediterranean, as the US Navy was to project itself into the Mediterranean in 1943, as the US Navy was to come back and project itself and stay in the Mediterranean after 1945. You had a key maritime forward wedge. It was said when the British took uh, Gibraltar 100 years before this Napoleonic War that by seizing that strategic point of Gibraltar, what Great Britain did was to divide France from France and Spain from Spain. If you think about it, ladies and gentlemen, we would be hard put today even to think of a more strategical, important position than Gibraltar. And one or two further afield which were picked up in that great struggle for empire and for hegemony in Europe. Uh, the Cape, Freetown, Singapore, Alexandria, uh, Falkland Islands, all to do with sea power and the sources of sea power and the manifestation of sea power. There's much as we send our navies out today, as we have our fleets out today across the globe, to reflect on where it all started. And perhaps we could say in the modern times it started with this great struggle for navies and for essentially the world. The, this war of uh, the Napoleonic War and before it the French Revolutionary War uh, was also an amphibious war. We sometimes forget about that when we think of, yes, I know about the Napoleonic War. It was where, it was where Nelson uh, won the great victory of Trafalgar off the uh, southwest coast of Spain. But more than that, it was amphibious war and it was carried out amphibiously in various theaters over the 23 years or so. And it teaches us a lot of lessons. Amphibious operations occurred in that period, sometimes disastrously when it ignored topography and epidemiology. Some of the worst setbacks of British naval amphibious la landings occurred in the Caribbean. You may be able to beat the French and you'd be able to beat the Spanish, but it was pretty hard to beat malaria. It was pretty hard to beat the tsetse fly. It was pretty hard to go into places where human beings were not supposed to go. If there's one great lesson in strategy, perhaps, it is that we should not go into places where geography and topography and, uh, and disease suggest that we should not be. But it was widely successful when this amphibious campaigning was within the nation's capacities, as it was in the projection of force to Alexandria and Egypt, to Malta, to Cape Town, another great Another great strategical point which divides one ocean from another ocean. And the projection further after 1803 into what we call the Eastern Seas. The struggle against Napoleon, the struggle particularly by Great Britain and its navy, uh, was one which did be carried out on land, but we should notice that the, that the British army was not large. It was Wellington's army. Whatever the victories it garnered under the Iron Duke was not a very, very large army at all. To begin with, as the old joke goes, it was not a particularly English army at all. If it hadn't been for the Scotch and the Irish, we would have been nowhere. Or the Hanoverians or the German Legion. So it was nothing like, uh, at its largest, the ground forces which we projected into Korea and again into Vietnam. 
and nothing like as large as the military force which we projected first of all into the Mediterranean with torch across the Pacific and of course that massive projection of amphibious force in June uh, 1944. This was one where sea power could, by the application of amphibious warfare, not need so large an army. In some great struggles we do, in other ones we do not. And above all, we should reflect that the eventual victory of the Allies against Napoleon rested upon, ladies and gentlemen, a productive and growing industrial base, sound finances, and solid credit. Solid credit. Do we think that Great Britain fought that war simply by paying out of its own resources? Of course it did not. It went to its European bankers, it went to uh, Nathan Rothschild again and again and again. It was because it had great credit, because it was recognized as a country which would pay back its loans and its bonds and its treasuries, that it could not only generate its own native resources for the long struggle, but borrow and then after the war pay back and then after the war reduce its national debt. There's something to think about in that, ladies and gentlemen. Of all the great seven wars that the British fought against Napoleon and Spain uh, from 1688 to 1815, the expenses were great and it turned to the credit markers were great, but the, the desire to pay off and reduce the national debt as swiftly as possible after the war was also great. Going to the bankers, appealing to your creditors, was something that you did when you got into war. It was not something you did one year after another by asking the Congress to increase the indebtedness of this nation in peacetime. It was not. Without this credit line, without this productivity, without this resourcefulness, based upon the geopolitical position, there could have been no defeat of Napoleon and after him, Hitler. But we have to recall that both Napoleon and Hitler helped so, so badly, or should we should say perhaps so, so well, to defeat themselves. If you're ever in a great war, it occurs to me, it's really useful when the other side helps to defeat themselves so dramatically as Napoleon and then Hitler did. There was no real rival. There was no real rival at all. And therefore, for the whole period after 1815, there could be a period in which uh, the British could, this hegemonic war over, display themselves, but display themselves carefully. And here are some lessons at all to consider uh, when we think about the US Navy to date. What are the lessons in essence of what we call the so-called Pax Britannica? It was not a lesson of arrogance, nor should the Pax Americana be thought of a, bringing a lesson of arrogance. It was a, a lesson of, of balance, judicious balance. It was a lesson in which this, this power which had won the Great War could expand and exude itself across the globe. But carefully, it was a place where you, some places you went to and some places you did not go to. It was a period of long-term peace punctuated by wars from time to time, as small as possible. It was a one in which, yes, it seemed as if you were on, the, on your own, but really even in the middle of the 19th century, the British had allies in different strategic parts of the globe. It was a long period in which, in, again, rising industrial and productive output and good credit worthiness were at the fore. It was a place where as the age of, as the age of sail, as the age of gunpowder coming from the barrels of Nelson's fleet were to turn into industrial power, the age of wireless, the age of dreadnought, the age of, 
of rail. It was where then you had the advantage of your forward and advanced technology. Navies move over time and move again and again. That's why industrial technological advance and sophistication is so, so significant. It was an era in which you could go into certain seas and come out of certain seas. Sometimes you stayed because you did have allies, but most of the time, the great advantage of sea power, ladies and gentlemen, as uh, Bacon, uh, the great uh, observer of, of Queen Elizabeth I's navy and policy, the great advantage of sea power, said Bacon, is that we may take as much of a war as we will and as little. Now, years later, many people criticized Bacon for saying that there are actually some wars in which you cannot walk away. There are some places in which you have to stay, supported by your sea power. What I want to stress today in recalling the aphorism of Bacon was that sea power surely should give us flexibility. It should give us that extra, extra element which those pinned down by land do not have. It should give us that capacity, that surge power, to come again across the oceans. It is amazing to me as I try to teach uh, Admiral Carter about navies and naval power in my new uh, Navy ROTC classes at Yale because the ROTC, Navy and Air Force ROTC, have come back to, to Yale two years ago after 40 years of their absence to teach these brilliant students is how little they know of the sea, how little they know of warships, how little they know of geography. We rest upon the sea. 95% of our commerce today moves on the sea. We hardly see it. We fly everywhere. Heck, my Yale students know more about the uh, the uh, four terminals at Heathrow Airport <laughs> than they know about an American frigate. Um, but there it is. We have to teach and instruct them, many of whom, just like the rising ranks of the officers here, many of whom are going on to Congress and elsewhere and to understand what the sea is, how significant it is, where we can use it and where we cannot use it. This is the importance of history. This is the importance of grand strategy. So that long period after 1815 is indeed useful for our consideration as we think about the United States and its Navy in the long period after 1945 and especially going on into the future about which in a few minutes I will, I will turn. Uh, but you can see what I'm now doing. I'm trying to bring certain aspects from each of these periods of history and saying, which of these might we, might we put in our bag? Which of these might we, might we bring forward with us? You may then think it odd that I'm going to spend a little bit of time now upon lessons which might be drawn on aspects of the First World War in the evolution of sea power and in the place of the United States Navy in it. It was very little, it seemed to me, and it seems to many, that there are lessons then to be drawn from the First World War because the United States Navy was not in the war for the first full three years of that conflict. It did not enter the global conflict, which we call the First World War, until its third year in 1917, provoked by unrestricted German U-boat warfare. It was perhaps even more aloof from Europe in those three years of 1914 to 1917 than it was, I will argue, between 1939 and 1941, notwithstanding which there remain interesting facets to Americans' naval experience during which what was merely the final 16 months of a conflict the U.S. Navy was actually in far better shape and size in 1917 than the Army when the Congress declared war. Ever since the Civil War and with a brief hiccup in 1898 war against Spain, the Army was a minuscule, 
Indian hunting and garrison force with neither the weaponry, the logistics, and the men for massive fighting in Europe, when the large American divisions, the double-sized American divisions, reached France from 1917 onwards, they had to borrow from the British and the French. The wherewithal, the machine guns, the communications equipment, the artillery, especially the French artillery, we had none of our own. Our men were swiftly drafted en masse here in 1917, but they had no training. So even when the first divisions got to France, they were heavily reliant upon British and French armies and army instructors, as well as trucks, artillery, signals equipment. It was only in 1918, mid-1918, that the strength of U.S. land performance became real, very significantly near the end of the fighting, the end of the war, when the Germans saw more and more of those massive divisions moving towards the frontier and towards Berlin. They knew the game was up. But for a long period of the war, it had been more our naval power, not our land power, and more Great Britain's naval power that was in evidence. The contrast then with the US Navy has to be made the Navy had benefited from the overall navalism of the turn of a century by the aura of the Great White Fleet, by Roosevelt's unshaken support, by the pretty hefty naval industrial complex, even then. It had also benefited the Navy had from being a nifty propaganda campaign to a suspicious and inward-looking Congress. The more powerful a navy, which was, of course, completely in American hands, the more secure were America's own shores, and the less and less likely a hostile invasion. Even overseas possessions like Cuba, Puerto Rico, Hawaii were all right. They were all right because they gave early warning of foreign activity. When America was brought into the war, then the reason for it reinforced his propaganda. Had the war not been caused by callous German attacks upon American civilians and American shipping, had it not been caused by that, not paying attention to international law, that being the case, only a strong American Navy standing there working with other navies could ensure the freedom of the seas. When American troops then were sent in those large numbers to France, they required naval protection from the U-boats across the seas. In practical terms, the First World War also did two great things for the US Navy. A full squadron of American battleships was sent to join the Grand Fleet at Scapa Flow and thus strengthen the, uh, to join the Grand Fleet and thus strengthen the Royal Navy and the Allied navies. And it there experienced up-to-date command and control techniques, gunnery, and participated in large fleet maneuvers the same U.S. Naval Squadron under Vice Admiral Sims was thus able to be in attendance and in full conflict readiness when the German high seas fleet after the armistice steamed across the North Sea and surrendered to the Allies off Rosyth, practically to the Grand Fleet and to all of the other Allies. Here was the surrendering German high seas fleet. I often wonder, ladies and gentlemen, what a young, uh, a young American who was on one of, the, one of the warships, on one of the USS Connecticut there in November 1918, when he looked out and said, look, somebody called, look, and there is the, the German high seas fleet surrendering. And when he bet, went back home on the farm, and he said, hey, Billy boy, what did you see? What was the most interesting thing you saw in your two years in the Navy and over in Europe? Was it the surrender of the German high seas fleet because of Allied and Western sea power? I think it must have been. I think it must have been a memorable day, not the only one in the 20th century for sea power. Sims' evidence for enthusiasm and enthusiastic commitment to the British was not shared by all of the U.S. Navy. We know there were anglophonic elements in it which would continue their jealousy and paranoia of the larger Navy until 
the 1930s when the Japanese Navy took over to be the boogeyman and when the hall of this great place was adorned with the wall map of War Plan Orange as we see it just a few minutes away from here. Since the Versailles settlement, a rapid return to US isolationism took place. The cooperation of Scarpa Flow went into history. But the US Navy learned a great deal in anti-submarine warfare operating out of the Irish ports in the last two years of the war in, in 1917 and 1918. It would have to be learned all again, of course, in 1941. In the 1920s and 1930s, Admiral Carter, I move on, American sea power was dormant, introspective, laggard, although its defenders would argue that it was also latent, something of a sleeping force needing to be aroused when real challenges emerge. Since the US economy had by then become the greatest in the world, even greater than Britain's, American navalists wanted, of course, to have this country have the largest battlefield. But the public and the Congress wanted not to see that battle fleet in action, wanted to see it in home base. The compromises at the Washington treaties helped that. It allowed a long period of, of naval holiday, a long, a long period of naval peace. In the middle of this peace, it seemed as if the, the US Navy, though it was large, had very little to do. Perhaps the only thing it had to do was here at, uh, at Newport, devising war games. In the first instance, I say to some amusement of mine, devising war games in the 1920s and early 1930s against my beloved Royal Navy, the only other game in town, <laughs> the only other large and efficient Navy at all, because as I say, the Japanese Navy is not yet on the shore. I have to give an anecdote here, Admiral. In, uh, in October, during the Yale break, my wife said, we've had enough of hanging around New Haven. You are going to get in a car with me. We're going up to Marblehead. We're going to have a few days there in that, in that lovely old uh, shipping port, that lovely old whaling port. We're going to be there and we're going to wander around. And lo and behold, Ladies and gentlemen, what did Professor Kennedy see but a little shop called Marine Memorabilia, a naval warfare shop. And I went in and I nosed around and the ancient man who owned it came up to me. He actually had been in one of our carriers in the Korean War. And he said, what do you think that's down there then? And I said, I don't know. It was a sort of attache box, it looked as if it unfolded, it looked as if it was a large, you know, some play, something you took to uh, Las Vegas and you took all the chips out and you played on it or, or a, a, a chess game or something. So we set it out and we opened it, all the dust came off it and do you know what it was, ladies and gentlemen? In there were dozens and dozens of miniature balsa wood copies of the battleships, the cruisers and destroyers of Her Majesty's Navy, <laughs> circa 1928. <laughs> and a notice inside the box said, property of the US Naval Artillery Division, <laughs> necessary, necessary for spotting practice against Royal Naval warships in the event of conflict. And I said, oh my God, oh my God, I must have this. <laughs> and there it is in my office in New Haven. If you want to come along to Professor Kennedy's office in New Haven, you can, if you're careful, take out this little balsa wood model. And to the astonishment of the old boy, he brought one out. And it was, uh, it was two and a half inches long, three funnels, uh, uh, two turrets for two aft two guns, probably about eight inch, and I said, that's a county class cruiser, probably HMS hmm, Dorsetshire. And he turned around and we looked underneath and there was HMS Dorsetshire. <laughs> I've never had a finer m moment <laughs> in my long career as a naval professor <laughs> than to identify it. My God, 
let's get out of here, Kennedy, my wife said, before we buy the whole store. <laughs> and then let us go to the greatest naval, naval encounter of all times, that of the, of the Second World War, and see what we draw from that very briefly, the points, but there are, again, major points, because we are the inheritors of the naval war of the Second World War, and we have, to, therefore, to briefly think of what was important about it at the end of the day. It was important because certain things were the circumstance of it. The Second World War was, again, a truly global war, Atlantic, Mediterranean, Western Europe, across the Pacific for the first time in such significant numbers. Just look by 1943, say, at the disposition of our warships, of our, of our U.S. Air Force squadrons, of our increasingly mobilized army. This was a global war. No doubt about it, a world war. It was, again, lest we forget, an alliance war. It was so useful to us once again to have those three years of breathing space and learning space. There were lots which we had to learn. It was so useful to have that large British Empire and that large Royal Navy, which in 1928, where we were intent upon sinking, that large Royal Navy out there on the oceans for three years fighting, experiencing things, and then alongside with us. We should not forget that. We inherited a global strategic position which was so favorable to us before, because we came in at the end of three years. And a global learning position. It's not surprising that although the Congress believed we were in a period of isolation, the US Navy and Newport uh, could tell you uh, a very great difference. The busiest office, I would guess, of the U.S. Navy, sir, between 1939 and 1941, was that of the U.S. Naval Attaché in, in London. Because there were so many things being learnt for when we would come in. Britain as a strategic shield for us, but also as the learning, the laboratory for us. Britain as a forward, indestructible base for when we went back into Europe, just as on the other side of Hitler's Grand Empire. There was building up the USSR, so it would be again a grand strategical alliance, as Churchill put it. Over on the east, a great wasting bloody mall. Over all, weakening, helping to weaken the Axis powers until they were brought down with great and horrendous casualties. It was a war, the Second World War, which manifested again the industrial and economic and financial unfolding with this nation with the capacity. By the end of the war, our gross domestic product was twice as large as it had been in 1940. It's very rare to fight a large, large expensive war and come out twice as rich. Unequaled in history, perhaps apart from some of the British wars of the 18th century. Did it pay for all of this? Of course the US did not pay for all of the expenses of the Navy, the Air Force, and the Army between 1941 and 1945, but it had, it had a lesson again from Great Britain. Its creditworthiness was large. We, with our strong creditworthiness, could raise monies, could float treasury bonds, could float five-year and ten-year bonds and go out and it could be subscribed to us as it was subscribed to Britain in earlier conflicts. I often think, and I, perhaps it did not occur to you until later in that wonderful movie, Sons of Our Fathers, the, the two-point movie which is about about Iwo Jima, that when the young American men are brought home to be displayed across the country in 1945, their task was to sell bonds. Those young and nervous Americans who had been at Iwo Jima, not quite sure who was there, who had planted a flag, were hastily brought home, uh, rather cynically, I think. But they were brought home because the American people had to understand they had to dip ever more into their pockets to buy more war bonds to pay for the victory 
of the conflict. And that all manifested itself, that victory manifested itself, not just in the dramatic battles of Midway and the Carolinas, not just in critical convoy protection, not just in the epic defeat of the U-boats. We often forget that the longest battle of the Second World War was the battle against the U-boats and against the Japanese submarines. It began on the first day, it ended on the last day. It was a war in which projected amphibious landings occurred in numbers we could hardly conceive of. It was a war in which an amphibious landing was being prepared, which had it happened, had not Hiroshima and Nagasaki occurred, it would have been the largest amphibious landing of all against the homeland of Japan. And therefore it is meet, I think, that the war ended in Tokyo Bay with the sun going down over Mount Fiji and in, therefore, in the bay itself, the dozens, hundreds of American and allied ships and the surrender being signed on the deck of the great battleship USS Missouri. It is symbolic, fitting very much. Let me briefly say something to the fourth and what for you might be the most intriguing and most important part of my remarks of sea power today, since 1945, and into the future. And there you will hold me and say, Professor Kennedy, you must also cover the period in detail from 45 to the present before you go into the future. You must say a lot about the Ronald Reagan age of sea power before you dare turn to the present and the future. But my reply will be, is, though if one keeps to the high ground of strategic analysis, as I'm trying to do today, then you will understand that this part of my story, from the Second World War to the present and turning into the future, can be seen as one historic era, a historic era in which we as historians and strategists can attempt once again to, to pull out three, four, five or six features which were of this period since the Second World War, which are of today and which I think will be of tomorrow. To do so, I mean that a full understanding of the past is not going to inform everything that will happen in the future. We're not tied down to the past. The past informs us. It does not control us. It does not tell us the complete truth. It certainly does not tell us in a narrow sense what to do. We engage with historical uh, study here at Yale and at Newport to broaden our awareness, to sensitize us, to make us ask questions. We have no fixed blueprint, but we know what blueprints are. So we have to pay attention to everything. We have to pull back, though, in knowing everything about the smaller parts of war in knowing where the different parts fit in and being aware of what I've recently called the engineers of victory, the problem solvers who turn the tide in past wars and I think will turn the tide in future wars, we have to stand on the top of the hill and see how the caravan of history has unwound over time since 1945. How it is as it reaches the point exactly opposite us and is winding further, as caravans do, into the future. It winds into the future not as a single predeterminate straight highway, as if going across the Arizona desert. It winds into the future forward inexorably as a river going into a distant sea. And therefore, the position, the attributes we should be looking for are not dissimilar to some of those which we have looked at in the past three examples. This is the point of this whole lecture. In going forward, we can be sensitized. In going forward, we can be assisted by the story of the Trafalgar War, of the great wars of the Royal Navy. We can be assisted by the long Pax Britannica. We can be assisted by the First and Second World Wars and their main attributes. Very, very clearly, 
even though we have a navy which is so different from that of the Second World War, especially the First World War and of, of Nelson's time. Think about the, as we stand on that hill and look around, we have had the naval predominance that came out of the Second World War from 1942-43 onwards. The challenge of the Red Navy as it was developed in the late 50s and till the 80s was just that, a challenge. And despite some legitimate worries about the submarine fleet of the Soviets and Soviet naval war capacities, it did not come close, it did not come close to ours. Just as in the various naval war scares of the Victorian era, the Challenger did not come close to Britain's naval predominance. Since 1945, we know there has been this totally different experience, the experience, the fact, which is with us today, the fact of Hiroshima, the fact of nuclear weapons. Of course it is there. In admitting to the unique existence and power of nuclear weapons, we may still nonetheless, I would argue, inquire to the shape of international sea power and of the America's role, the American Navy's role in it. The United States, since 45, went forward with a series of alliances, most of which still it has today. It has vast forward positions after 1945 in Europe, the Mediterranean and Pacific, which it still has today. The contours of American naval strategy from 1945 are still remarkably similar as today. This powerfully shapes then, or should powerfully shape, U.S. naval strategy for the years to come. We have a presence over there. I really mean over there. We have established, if you like, out of this American domestic base, two forward bases of American strategic power. One is in Western Europe and the Mediterranean. One is in the Western Pacific. The American island continent on the one hand and the two projections of the American homeland in Europe and the Western Pacific are our three sheet anchors of global strategy. If you get that right, you see the position of the US Navy within it. It is not a case between being back in isolation in the homeland or being strewn all over the globe, ladies and gentlemen. It is a position of recognizing that we have this home domestic base and we are there are two massive forward projections. That is what has happened after the Second World War. That is within there the Navy operates and the other armed services operate. It is this we have to convey to the Congress. This is a sort of Halford McKinder way of looking at the American Navy and naval sea power. It is not all over the place, nor is it in home bases alone. From this perspective, we put into some ordering the American interventions in parts of the globe which didn't go well and we pull them back. We put from this perspective the Amer American interventions away which we had to pull back from. We did not want to be there all the time and pulling back, however, from Korea, from Vietnam. We did not pull back to this great continent island. We knew when to pull back and where. If we have to go forward again, it, Im, it imposes upon us the duty to think of where we can go forward, where we should go forward. This is the lessons of sea power. This is the lessons of sea power in the past and in today. In the large argument of whether the United States is in decline, an argument which I seem to have got myself into year after year after year, so there's hardly a time in which I can open a paper without a new book these days, ladies and gentlemen, with the title of something like The Myth of American Decline. It is hardly, hardly a, 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 a week emerges with, ladies and gentlemen, without some nasty young Yale uh, students of mine coming along and saying, Professor Kennedy, have you, see this, have you seen this new article in the Nation magazine called 
grand flattery. And I say, well, what is this? What is this new article called Grand Flattery about? And the answer is in the subtitle, the Yale Grand Strategy Program. The title is Grand Strategy, the Yale Grand Strategy Program. Grand Flattery. It is not Grand Flattery. It is a study of where we can go and where we should not go. And the Navy is going to play a powerful determinant in that. We're not going forward all over the globe. We cannot win. We cannot control the uh, great wastelands of Siberia. Not even a million US Marines could take over the Amazon basin. What would we do? We cannot now, I think, take Southeast Asia. We have no, no place in Afghanistan. Please, we have no place in Afghanistan, where the local brutal tribes have been there for millions of years, presumably, where they are very good at fighting, where when the Marines went in, they said, thank you. You know, we have a slogan for you. And when you ask what the slogan was, when my Yale Marines asked, what is the slogan about Afghanistan? It was, you Americans have the watchers. We have the time. There are places in the world which an intelligent American leadership above all political leadership, but then the leadership of the Navy, the Air Force, and the Army should not be going. There are other places where we can be. It is figuring that out and figuring out where the positions of our armed services should and can be. That is the duty of us teaching, thinking. Therefore, the sweep of naval history, going back to Napoleon and Nelson, coming forward through the Pax Britannica, coming through the First World War and the period of appeasement and isolationism, coming through that epic Second World War, that has points for us to ponder on, especially if we know how to sift the points that are important and turn them around and let them condition us. Let them be with us. Let us understand them. Let us not say, we know all about the past. We can take it easily into the future. We do not. But there are things about the past which carefully examined, thoughtfully examined. We can and we have to, Admiral Carter, take into the future. That is the function of this Naval War College. That is the function of the faculty, of the officers, of the of the cadets, of the mid-level officers here. That is why we are here at the Naval War College. And it has been my honor, Admiral and ladies and gentlemen, to try to remind us of why the three great naval wars of modern times and what we do teaching them here is so important for the United States now and for the decades into the future. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for being such a good audience and for being such good hosts. Now, Admiral, what is my fate? Professor <laughs> Kennedy, you've uh, invoked my name quite a bit now. <laughs> I, I, I like sharing the blame. Be happy, sir. Thank you, sir. Hey, sir. I'm, I'm Major Chris Kennedy. I'm, I'm your namesake. Um, on, on I, I'm so so sorry. <laughs> Straight ahead, twelve o'clock, sir. Red hair. <laughs> You, you don't understand when you're, please, when you're addressing questions to me, the Admiral should have told you. I um, look like, I look like I'm, well, I feel like I'm Groucho, Groucho March on the, on the stage. There's, there's lights coming at me from all directions. So when you say, please, sir, I have a question, I'm, 
I'm named Kennedy as well. Please wave your hands so I can see like, where you are. That would be great. Hello, out there. <laughs> Focus. Uh, portions of your lecture touched on economics and, and mentioned the Congress and, and at the same time grand strategy. It's something that we all think about because uh, we ultimately worry about um, the power of our nation in the future and how um, we, we may have mortgaged that for a while. Uh, so, given kind of the deadlock in Congress over, over what each party wants to protect and fund, how do we ever really get to a point where our, our economic strength returns to where it needs to be uh, for what we want to accomplish in the future? Thank you, sir. That's, um, that's a large important, it's perhaps the most important a question of all, and I think there's hardly anybody, nobody in this, uh, in this room tonight doesn't know that is the largest question. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the general of uh, Philip II of Spain said in, uh, back in the 16th century, uh, what do you need to win wars? And the answer was money, money, and yet more money. And what do we need to be consistent and strong at present and into the future? We need productive economic creations of strength creations of the, of the sinews of war, not that we want to use them, but we understand that without a balanced, at least a reasonably balanced economy, without a nation and a treasury that is in credit, the credit which will allow us to go forward if, I hope not, we are in some future large war, we have to turn not only upon the resources that we have, but the resources that we can then go and raise to assist what we have. We have to have good credit. We have not taught that. We, I'm afraid, have not taught it to our political leadership. There were times in the story of the United States after 1945 when we had that credit. There were times when we were in such surpluses that perhaps we neglected it. The lesson has to be driven home again and again, and I'm afraid to say it has to be driven home to our congressmen and to to our senators. They are the keepers of the public purse by definition. Just as the English Parliament was the keeper of the purse, is still but for 400 years. They have to ensure the strength of a nation, the creditworthiness of a nation. They have to ensure the size of the armed forces being what is needed. And they have to see that the strength of a nation is not just in the projection of an aircraft carrier task group, impressive though that is. The strength is in the financial sinews and the product, uh, productive sinews. And it, is upon, it rests upon us. And it rests, I think, I would say this, Admiral Carter, it rests more upon us who are the civilians, the professors, the teachers the civilians in this country, to say it to our political leaders that this has to be put in order, it has to be put in shape. It's very difficult, and in fact it's probably unconstitutional, sir, for the, the armed services of the United States to say, we need this sense, we need this sensitivity, we need you to understand how important it is to have good credit and to have good, impressive modern armed forces. It is the civilian part of this country which have to tell our civilian leadership to do it. And there, of course, therein lies the rub. We are so far away from getting that in order. If we can, and it's not too difficult, I do not come along as some of the people who say our uh, grand strategy is about flannery and flattery, uh, or upon the idea that grand strategy is just about decline, that that is what we have, that is all that we have. We have, like geopoliticians in the past, to see where our strengths are and where our weaknesses are. We have to teach that as well as pointing to the weaknesses. We have to go back to building upon our strengths, ensuring our strengths are developed, protected. We have a when one looks at this country from other parts of the globe, so such an enormous list of strengths, strengths that we do not even articulate, we do not even teach about. When we bring those strengths to bear, 
then even the large challenge of our structural financial deficits and our trade deficits comes somewhat into balance. The lecture upon the great strengths of the United States, and I'm not talking about in particular the Constitution. We have a democratic Constitution, so have another 120 countries. We can't look there really so much for our uniqueness. We can't look at the rhetoric of our politicians and say, there, we have such a grand array of politicians. We cannot. We cannot be looking at the superficial aspects of our strength. The strength lies in a continent which stretches 3,000 miles from sea to sea, which has no hostile force over there in 6,000 miles of ocean, and on the other side, 3,000 miles of ocean, which has a benign large Canada to the north and a benign of somewhat turbulent Mexico to the south. What is a great power? There, said Bismarck, is a great power. I could be a great power, said Bismarck, if I had a benign Canada to the north and a benign Mexico to the, to the south, and if I had 3,000 and 6,000 miles of separated ocean. That's all you need. On those bases then, and on that vast productive agrarian plains, on that vast amount of raw materials, you base your credit. You base and project outwards. You don't have to forget that. What we are talking about is a policy which forgets the geopolitics of the size of a nation. Ask yourself uh, what other powers would like to be in our geopolitical a position before you start moaning the list of things which have gone wrong, the list of our problems. Before you start thinking about the rise of China, think a little bit more geographically. But alas, as I say, my students at Yale do not think geographically. They look at China and say, wow, look at that, it's growth rates. Professor Kennedy in the political science department, I'm told that China's growing twice as fast as we are. What's going to happen? There's a projection in The Economist. China will be twice as great as we are, twice, twice as grand GDP as us in, 19, in 2050, 2040, 2025. I say, yeah, yeah, it might be. Uh, by the way, have you recently, have you recently, young Jim, young Sally, have you recently uh, recalled how many uh, borders of nations, some of them pretty hostile, uh, China has. They say, no. I say, well, shall we like spend the next five minutes listing China's neighbors? All 13 of them. Or Mr. Putin's Russia. All 14 of them. We would think uh, rather differently, would we not, ladies and gentlemen? If we, as the United States, had 14 rather sullen, uh, growling, small, but nasty neighbors around us, think of that. Uh, we should think of particular countries which are running out of water supplies. I am not referring here with a joke to uh, California. <laughs> I have, I should say, Admiral, I have, I have uh, three of my students at Yale, um, all amazingly female, all amazingly blonde, all amazingly from, uh, from Los Angeles, uh, come back to Yale shivering and shivering every January and say, wow, what are we doing here? And I say, well, <laughs> well just a minute. Oh, I forget about this. All amazingly called Rachel. <laughs> How many Rachels can a professor at Yale have? <laughs> Rachel, as you shiver here and as you see all of that water congealing into ice, you, you, growing up near the Mojave Desert with only the Colorado River coming down to feed your nice lawns, you should think about what having a lot of water is for a grand power into the future. We have, along with Brazil, 
the largest amount of fresh water supplies in the world and will have it through the 21st century. Now just go off and project the fresh water supplies of China for the next even 15 or 25 years and see if there's anything left with which to put into the scotch which members of the Chinese Politburo like so much <laughs> to turn it into a scotch and water. It will have to be straight scotch, I think. <laughs> or even Russia with its great, great rivers, but all heading north to the Arctic. All of the great rivers of Russia heading in the wrong direction, unfortunately. We have water, we have great agrarian plains, we have vast resources, we have, we have a growing, our demographics are so incredibly favorable. Again, if you do the demographic comparative and you look at the shape of our demographics and the projections of our demography and you look at those as only one or two or other three or four nations in the world which have the most benign demographics that we have. Brazil, I've mentioned already. Canada, Australia, Great Britain unusually in its balance, in its demographic growth, in its in the shape of its population size, in its, uh, in, its, in its female fertility levels. Most of the countries in the world either have too many people per thousand or far too few people per thousand. Too many young growing people or too few. We have just the right balance. Our, our fertility rates, our balance, our structured population is a massive strength for us in the future. I ask those who get themselves so worried about the immigration debate to step backwards and ask, would you like to have a population such as that a southern Yemen, which is doubling every 11 or 12 years? Or would you like to have the population problem of Mr. Putin whose Russia loses 750,000 population every year. Would you like to have the population problem of far too many Mars or far too few? Just count your blessings, as my Irish grandmother used to say. So I say in a long-winded uh, remark and answer to you, sir. Uh, uh, it's tip everyone knows it. My wife knows it. It's, it's Professor Kennedy's second lecture. <laughs> <laughs> you see, it's a way we have, we professors have, of, of saying that's, that's a good, that's an important question. And then, you, and then you put it around into another lecture. So where is my third lecture tonight? Sir. Dick Diamond, a former naval person. During that long protracted period of peace between the Napoleonic Wars and World War I, the British government very successfully uh, re refused to invest vast treasure in its navy, even though it realized the power of sea power and more or less tended to maintain the navy while they built up the credit, built up the empire, and built up their prosperity with the idea being that when a threat comes on the horizon, they would have the resources to surge the Navy once again. Looking forward, how do you think that model would work for the U.S. and the U.S. Navy as we face the future? Well, the comparison immediately, sir, is not, is not too favorable to the United States. Of course it is not. We, we have not understood that the credit of a nation as the great... Uh, uh, Victorian British Prime Minister said, Lord uh, uh, William Gladstone, Gladstone said the, the strength of the nation, the innate strength of the nation is the great reserve power we have in our credit. Credit which we keep dry, powder which we keep dry. We do not spend so much right now because if we unfortunately have the politicians who get us into a war, said Gladstone, we have to turn around to our resources behind us, our benign resources, our vast resources. We do not spend it all. We should have great powder kegs, our reserve forces in credit and productivity and in balance. 
here again, and I won't give a lecture to that as long as the second lecture, which I just recently gave. Here again, it seems to me it's obvious. It's not a rocket science. It's not a rocket science to anybody who's trying to balance a budget in their own household, for God's sake. If you have too, if you borrow too much, if your credit worthiness is too low, then you are in trouble. The point is not to return down to narrowness entirely, but to balance your credit and your strength with what needs to be done. We can see that. We have to teach that. We have to teach that it is in the vast resources and the credit worthiness of this country that the future lies. The armed services are but the outward manifest manifestation, the insurance policy. You have to think of the armed services of this country, of the Navy, as the insurance policy of this country. And therefore, when you are asked about the costs of the Navy and you turn to ask yourself, well, what percentage of the cost of your house do you give out each year to the insurance company as fire insurance and flood and hazard insurance? And you begin to figure that's about, you know, two or three or four percent. That is the insurance of your house against disaster. The armed services are the insurance against disaster of the nation. Put in that context, put in that way of thinking, we have to, we see it that way, but our credit worthiness has to be good so we can go to the insurance companies of global geopolitics. We can go to the bankers of the world and have that credit. That's the way you look at it, in the largest form, upon the two or three legs of this nation. There is the leg of credit, the leg of intelligent statecraft and politics, and the leg of the armed services and productivity of the nation. On that triangle, we can be strong, given one of those legs festering and becoming weak. We are not strong. I hope I cannot say that enough, but some in the audience will say I may have said it a little bit too much, in which case I beg your pardon. Admiral, sir, would you like me to take one more question and then we wrap up? Is there any person who would like to be so, so courageous and bold? Please come. Um, um, addressing the need to uh, protect our credit worthiness, you and addressing what you said uh, earlier during your speech about our projection into Europe and the Far East. It raises the question to me about forward basing of our troops, of, of both land troops, sea troops, and air troops, all three. Um, we derive great benefit from that forward basing um, in power projection, our ability to respond more quickly. But one of the ways we could, in fact, continue to develop our capacity, our military capacity, while still finding economies would be to do away with that basing. Do you think we could find a way to make it a worthwhile bargain to sacrifice the advantages of forward basing, but still maintain some of the benefits? The question of forward basing, a uh, very, very critical question, very, another large question. I assure you I will not be as lengthy as I was in the first answer. Uh, we, we believe in forward basing because we think at times in the future where may, we may be called to project ourselves forward. Uh, we, we do not have uh, army bases and air force bases and navy bases out there because we like it. We have it out there because we suspect they may be needed. If we have too many of them, that's an overbalance. If we have too few of them, we will learn that that was a mistake. The balance of the... the, the Bases forward, the projections forward are part of where we are and who we are. We might do it more effectively in the future. We might find a way of moving resources there faster so there's less of us and our shield forward in the future. Uh, we have, we inherit this posture of a previous great world power, which is what my lecture was on tonight, what my remarks are to, on tonight, because Think about this as we, as we leave for the evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. In, um, 
in the first two great world wars of this century, the United States was the last to come to the fight. It came from behind to move to the outward limits of the fight, of the struggle. Our strategic posture was in the rear. But since 1945, as Professor Sam Huntington at Harvard taught us some years ago, since 1945, our strategic posture has been to be the first out there. And rethinking about that and working out what that means has been the biggest challenge of all to us. To pull back entirely is no good. To be overcommitted too far is no good. This is why perhaps, perhaps our global strategic juggling act is even greater than the global strategic juggling act of Great Britain. That's why we need to think historically and strategically. That's why we need, in posturing ourselves forward and projecting forward, to make sure we have the strength at home and make sure we have the political leadership at home which recognizes the relationship between economics and military power, relations between being out there and being here. That is it. If we can get it together, there is no need for alarm in the long term, if we can get our political leaders to see what it will take to reduce our deficits, to reduce our weaknesses, to understand our strengths, but to perceive that we have weaknesses that need attended. That is what the job here is. That is what the job of intellectuals and professors in this country is. We're trying to do it a little bit this afternoon. I have wearied you Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your patience. I thank you, Admiral, for inviting me, and I thank the Foundation for inviting me. Thank you so much. <laughs>